you know, I used to do before a pandemic and looking forward to do it again is I, my recitals were an outdoor event called the guitar barbecue and I would cook. <laughs> That's a great yeah. time. <laughs> and so my, the first recital I ever did when I started teaching, I had like three kids show up, you know, one of which now is a principal bassist for the Seattle symphony. But the next year I was like, this sucks. No one showed up to my recital. And so the next year I, I cooked like a hundred pounds of pulled pork and had a big sign made and did an outside performance where all the kids got to play. And I had 200 people show up because they were allowed to bring their friends. And I was like, wait a second. And that was my only marketing budget was I did the guitar barbecue. And then every time I do the guitar barbecue, I would have enough, I'd have enough leads that people want to come in for the whole year. So, you know, it's just going kind of with your heart, I think is really a helpful approach. Hey there, it's Tim and I just wanted to let you know that if you're teaching guitar or want to break into offering guitar lessons to expand your business, you are going to want to check out our brand new show, The Top Music Guitar Podcast with Michael Gumley. It's airing on Friday on all podcast platforms as a weekly show. You'll get insider advice on how the best guitar studios get built and how to teach guitar lessons that students will keep coming back for. Don't miss it. Come and check it out now. Hi teachers, it's Tim Topham and you are listening to another episode of The Topcast. This is episode number 274 with the amazing Eric Branner from Fonz. I'm going to introduce to you Eric in just a moment and we're talking about all sorts of different things including rates and business and marketing and also the great software for music studios called Fonz. Uh, But before that, I wanted to let you know about a couple of quick things going on at Top Music. Firstly, lots of you know about our No Book Beginner course, which I released back in 2016 or thereabouts, and which has challenged that first lesson dynamic for thousands of teachers around the world. But many of you may not know that the amazing Nicola Canton created an entirely updated version of No Book Beginners for use with preschoolers. So our preschool No Book Beginners course has been a hugely popular course inside our Top Music Pro Academy and is available to any member looking to gain confidence and skills teaching preschool aged children, which can actually be a huge untapped market for teachers who enjoy working with students, uh, younger students under the age of six. This is just one of the more than 35 courses that you can get full access to now over at topmusicpro.com. And if you're a member, just head to the academy and search for preschool. You'll be able to find it if you haven't checked it out before. And I quickly wanted to mention one of our popular freebies over on the main site, and that's our playing scales on autopilot download. If you find your students have kind of got to that point with their scales where they're like, oh, yeah, you know, kind of scrolling through their Snapchat while they're playing with their scale with their other hand because it's all just got a bit boring and a bit too easy, then it's time to mix things up and switch off the autopilot for students. I've created a short video about what I do and I'm giving away a three-page download of scale playing tricks, tactics and challenges. It's all over on the main website. If you want to find it, the best thing to do is actually just Google Top Music Autopilot and you'll be able to find it pretty quickly. All right, let's get on with the show. My guest today, Eric Branner, is the CEO and co-founder of Fonz.com, an award-winning web-based platform that streamlines payment and scheduling for appointment-based businesses. He's also a Seattle-based guitarist, teacher, author, songwriter, and owner of the Black Forest Music School. Welcome to the Topcast, Eric Branner. Welcome to the show, Eric Branner. So great to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be with you. Well, I've been meaning to have you on the show for ages. So first up, apologies that we haven't got you there yet, but I'm glad we're doing it today. You are so respected in our industry and have a huge wealth of knowledge and experience that um, I know you're only too happy to share because I'm in some of your Facebook groups and I see uh, some of your user feedback and the questions you answer and all that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, really looking forward to a chat today. Me too. Thank you so much. So I thought it'd be good to kick things off. You're currently the co-founder of Fonz, which is studio management software that I know some of our listeners will have heard about. So we're going to dig into that a little bit later and find out a bit more about Fonz. But you're also a guitarist and guitar teacher. Um, Tell us a little bit about your journey from being a student to teaching. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, my, uh, my background is, yeah, I'm a classical guitar player. I grew up playing guitar. I knew that's what I wanted to do, but I came from a family of entrepreneurs. You know, my grandfather was a concert classical pianist and he was a band director his whole life and had a big band. And my father was a serial entrepreneur. So I had a real great kind of combination of support for pursuing the arts 
And I had a really deep love of teaching. I started teaching when I was in college uh, in music school and I just fell in love with it. And I was like, wow, this is something I want to do. So then I moved out to Seattle after my undergrad and to continue studying. And I started teaching and gigging and that became my path. You know, I opened up a music school here and just you know wrote a couple of books, just really enjoyed that scene and did that. You know, my wife is an actor. Oh, wow. And the two of us just had like a really cool creative existence here in the Pacific Northwest. And then about, you know, six years ago, I was really had been doing it a long time. And I always had in the back of my mind that I was at some time going to go to law school, get an MBA, you know, just kind of mix things up. That was always part of my plan. I mean, I, I majored in music, but I also studied business and I loved both of those realms. And I was just, I'd been doing it for a long time. So I was itching for something different. And that's when I kind of asked the universe and I had this opportunity to do a technology startup. So that's where the, my shift happens. I still do teach 10, 15 students every week. I, I, I intend to do that forever. So but just not as much as I used to. And what kind of acting does your wife do or did? <laughs> or did. Well <laughs> phrased. Yeah, yes. She does a lot of commercial work. Uh, you know, it was great. She was on the billboard over the West Seattle Bridge on a bike. So we got to wave to her every morning. What do your kids think of that? Do they think it's a bit weird or kind of cool? They think it's really cool. Right. Seeing mom. Yeah. And she was, you know, uh, so a lot of commercial stuff and some ads, but her real passion is stage acting. Right. right. So she uh, comes musicals, from a family. Of uh, sorry, plays and plays, theater. not musicals. Yeah. She's, yes. But more like just straight stage acting. Yeah, that must have been a rough time over the last two or three years. Wow. The roughest. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my goodness. Well, We musicians were able to pivot, right? It was two years ago this week that we all made the switch overnight. And we, you know, most musicians I know that were teaching, especially, like, we just had to make it work. And we did make it work. And we got through it somehow. But you know, actors are like, what are they going to do? Right? There's, that's a real hard one to move that realm online. Oh, Absolutely. Um, one of the, I want to get into a bit more of that founding story and find out more about um, how you came to start Fonz. But um, one of the things that's come out of that is I've really realized that one of your passions is helping teachers earn an awesome living from teaching. <laughs> that's what we want to do, right? We want to have fun doing it. We want to be confident doing it and we want to make a comfortable living. We don't want to always be on the breadline and, you know, just hoping for scraps of income. And I think one part of, of FONS, the software that you run, is, is helping student, um, teachers get organized and, and, and have their management, studio management kind of sorted out. But what are some of the other things you're seeing teachers do to really go from that kind of just surviving to feeling comfortable and awesome about their teaching? Yeah, you know, that's, a, that's an awesome question. And I think that a lot of what our mission has kind of become, if you know, go back to when we started is I was really grateful. I thought I was making a great living. I was making a great living, living here in Seattle, having a home, raising a family. And as we started building this, this platform, we started seeing and interviewing hundreds of people. The recurring theme is how little many people valued themselves right? There was so many like world-class teachers charging so little for their services, like half of what my car mechanic charges, right? And the deeper we started diving, we started finding these like these little gems of people that were like, oh no, I'm charging like four times that. And we found that not only were they, their clients were happy to pay it, they were twice as busy, right? And so that happened in, in, in my journey too, where I had a mentor that helped me set my rates appropriately, where suddenly when you go from being just getting by to making like a really good living, like a professional living, you know, you, you get a little more confident and you believe you in yourself. Yeah, yeah, you, 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 you see taller. yourself. Yeah. And you see yourself as what you are, which is a major asset to the community. Like people value our work so highly. And the people that that we're that are we're working for or the people that we're, we're providing for, they're professionals. You know, if I teach a lawyer that's charging like 700 bucks an hour for their services, they're not going to be at all uncomfortable with me charging 150 an hour for my services, right? That's just, it's just this kind of mindset that has become, I'd say it's been half the work that we've done in Fonz is really trying to lift those waters of just people feeling confident and understand that they have so much education and they're, the gifts that they're giving to people, right, are huge. Yeah. We've battled against that. It's it's the kind of poor creator or, or artist mentality, I think, which is to say that 
we're providing a community service and we're doing good for the world, which is more important than charging what we're worth or is a different kind of argument to charging what we're worth. So you, you found the same thing with your, some of your, the teachers that have come into your realm as well. Well, I would say 100%. And it seems, I think it's changed a lot in the last five years. Uh, and, and you see people starting to be out there doing it is that what one, and this, and we're talking, cause I don't want to talk about this people that are just like, that aren't into it. We're talking about people that are professionals, like that are really love the work and believe in the work and, and want to teach and believe in the subject matter they're sharing and their methodology. You know, these people that are out there, uh, the big thing that happens when they raise their rates is they just get busy. You know, and you know, I, I there's a story I tell so much. I'll be really brief, which is, you know, my experience was I was getting ready to leave the the field before this last time. It was like ten years, the ten year itch or whatever, and I was thinking about leaving. And one of my clients, who was a really well known business person here in Seattle, was like, "Dude, don't quit teaching, just double your rates." And this was, you know, 15 years ago now, and. I was so hesitant to do it. I had a beautiful studio, but I was just ready to kind of give it up and get a day job and start a family. And it was right around the time my daughter was born. And I just reluctantly did it. And no one cared. No one cared at all. And everyone was you like, literally oh, I'm so doubled. glad I did this. Oh, overnight, I doubled them. And the only you just said, guys, had Sorry, uh, I'm just, rates are going up next week, next lesson, they're this amount. Yes. And we, you know, we gave some grandfathering in over time, but the, the exercise it was, I was ready to go anyway. So right. I was a little bit <laughs> so like, I'm nothing ready. to lose. <clears throat> what do I have to lose? And my friend or my student slash mentor was just like, dude, we, we all want you here to see what happens. And I got nothing but support. And it was like these, the people, and I went to basically making a six figure living as a music teacher, 15 years. And I, and at that moment, that was when we were able to buy a house and start a family and then the only issue I had is I had a huge waiting list. Mm. And so the reality is I was charging twice as much as my last two teachers who are famous guitar players. I mean, they're, they're unbelievable musicians. They should be charging twice as much as I was, but I was getting more calls and referring people to them. And that's when I learned this thing about perceived value, which is that the reality is, is that if I say I'm this much and this person says they're this much, which is half of that. The pe many people can only judge by what you're willing to charge, right? And so they want what's best for their kids. So they'd be like, oh my gosh, Eric obviously must be a great choice. And so this just kind of got my head spinning and all these things led us careening towards developing fonts, right? Which is, which is kind of codifying all these ideas and then putting them into a structure for this company. Yeah, I was talking to my son the other day about he wanted to sell, sell something online or create something to sell. And we were talking about pricing and I was saying, well, you know, there's these shoe brands that charge $1,000 a shoe <laughs> or a pair of shoes and there's other ones that charge 50. So do you want to sell lots at $50 or do you want to sell a few to incredibly passion, impassioned buyers at the other end of the spectrum? And so you're saying we've got this, this same um, potential dichotomy with our music lessons as well do we go for the higher end charge knowing we will probably get fewer although you're you would contradict that and say well i actually had a big waiting list and i became more popular because the value seems to be there versus charging less and maybe having bigger numbers you would say you actually see the perceived value the increasing your rates and the value of that actually increase the number of people interested in your lessons I would stay, say that's categorically true because, and I would say that for the reason that A, parents really want what's best for themselves and their kids, right? As a parent now, you know this too. We want, we, we want that. You know, both my kids are, of course, athletes, the kids of an actor and a guitar player. Yeah, they're both going to be jocks. So we're learning about finding the people that, that, are, that are guiding them and we, we, the same principles. We want what's best for them. Two, the, the, the big issue that can come up here is, yeah, you're saying, do I charge more and have fewer or do I charge less and have more? And in general, think about who you're attracting, right? If I charge $5 and you charge $100, right? And there's a big difference. You know, the people that are going to come after the $5 lesson, it's a real different mindset, right? And I'm making that extreme on purpose. And so you create, well, A, you're giving yourself self-respect. And you're saying, I went to a lot of school. I've been doing this for 20 years. This is my life's I'm work. really good I at this type. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I deserve to make more than my the plumber that came to my house or the mechanic that fixed my, my car last week. That's fair. 
right? And, or at least the same. Uh, those are both really, and you know, the 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 piece that comes along with it, and we've seen this, I would say in a hundred percent of over a thousand people that we've seen make this transition to how they price themselves and how they value themselves. A, they stay in the game longer. B, they always get more clients. And then C, this lets them have that opportunity to say, wait, what about equity? Because you have to talk about that. Like, I don't want to be someone that's like just teaching bougie rich kids, right? Once you, th- this is the beautiful thing about this. That if you say, oh my gosh, I'm going to try to find the ceiling of what people will pay me, which I don't know anybody that's found. I can give you some examples, but kind of the sky's the limit for this, this model. But you say, okay, because I charge this, I am able to take anyone in based, you know, financial reasons are never a reason I'm not going to work with someone. And that's really important because I charge enough that I can afford to work with people that can't afford it. Or maybe now I've got enough bandwidth that I can do a group scenario, right? Where I'm still making my same thing. I can start exploring these different things where, you know, it's all good vibes, right? And so you're, you're like, whoa, I'm making a living. I'm doing well. Uh, I, you know, I'm presenting myself better, you know, whatever. And it, it, it really lead, moves in a great direction. I know there's going to be people listening who maybe live in the country there's, or there's high competition and they really feel they cannot charge much more than they're already charging and their rates are now low and families are struggling, et cetera. What would you say to those guys? Oh, those are my favorite. Uh, for, for, and, that, and that's just, that's a, gosh, these are such awesome questions. Uh, I grew up in a log cabin in a very rural part of the country, right? And you know, the house that I live in Seattle or, or the house, the average family home in Seattle, let's say it's close to a million dollars now, right? The average family home where I grew up in very rural Virginia is like 174,000, right? So even it, it's all on scale. So if I'm, there's two ways you can approach it. If I'm in the country, one, I can build a model where I'm say teaching online and trying to teach people in a more urban or a high wage area. But two, it's like the reality is it would be easier for me to make a living going back to where I grew up, right? I wouldn't need to make what I need to make here to live in Seattle, which is one of the most expensive cities in the country, right? So that argument, it's, 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 it's difficult because we talk with people and they're like, oh my gosh, I need to charge this much. And then how can you possibly charge this much? And it's like, wait, what's your cost of living? And cost of living has to be considered. Of course, the internet can fix that and you can start strategizing about making urban prices in a rural environment, which is awesome. And this, the second thing that I'm so glad you mentioned is competition because I have so much data on the fact that the next 10 years, there is no competition for any of us. And this is the beauty of our, of our Fonz community is starting in COVID, starting in the pandemic is the spike for what we're doing right now, communicating. Parents, are they know their kids are losing those skills. Not only were they on devices before, then the pandemic happened. What you do, what your listeners do, what we do, is we teach people how to communicate in a real way, how to express themselves in a real way. Um, it doesn't matter. I mean, we could be doing talking about physics and teaching physics. Parents are starving for it. And the numbers of people looking for good teachers, right? People that are really committed, people that are professionals, every piece of data that we can find is like the next 10 years is going to just be like kind of a hockey stick, right? So we're even, even with larger schools we work with, you know, they're getting slammed. They're turning people away because what's the value proposition? Yeah, I can teach you how to play guitar. That's cool. But also I can teach you how to be a human and give you a human experience, right? How about an hour off your iPad every week to be with a human who cares about you? And so this is. This is something we didn't expect as we were rolling this out and as we were looking at the landscape, but it's really beautiful. And it allows us to go deeper into our niches, right? Of what you really want to do. I only focus on kids seven to nine, I, you know, whatever, whatever area that is, you know, your, your thing, you are enabled to lean into it, which is so cool. That is such a good feel good commentary. I really enjoyed hearing that. And I know the listeners will as well, because it's so much doom and gloom out there. And uh, I know that uh, teachers have struggled with retention in the last two years. We all have. Um, Businesses have struggled. You know, it has been tough. But it's wonderful to hear you say that, Eric, because I think I agree there because I can look at it from the parent side. And I know lots of our teachers 
and members are parents as well. You look at it from the parent side as well and go, well, yeah, we do. We need that connection. What opportunities can we give our kids now that the world is opening up that doesn't involve screens and technology? And, uh, and it's great to hear you say that we could be uh, at the start of a growth period, which would be really exciting. One of the things that you've uh, touched on now is, is marketing yourself as well, and I know that's a real passion of yours. We've talked about pricing as being one way to market, and you've just now touched on a second thing, which was you said, we're not actually teaching guitar lessons. We're not teaching piano lessons. Well, we are, but that's not the outcome. The outcome is personal growth and development and responsibility and all of these amazing things. How can teachers improve the way they market themselves in the coming six months to a year? You know, I think I'm a big fan of long tail marketing. And by that, what does that I mean, mean for people? long tail means less Google and Facebook ads and more building relationships and building and doing great work and proving yourself. And you need both, obviously. But I think that it, the people that are listening to this, the people that are passionate about doing this type of work that are working with you and trying to really, to really become excellent at it. You, you mentioned this great thing. What are we selling? Well, you could sell it. You could say, I'm selling excellence, right? I'm selling excellence for your child to be excellent at something. And yeah, this, this personal development, this growth, I have this, you know, my value proposition that I, for my teaching, which is the reason I'm still teaching is that, and I get five or 10 calls a week for lessons, even is for 25, 20 years, I've been in Seattle and I've really cared for these kids. And my value proposition is that the kids that study with me through, I take them through middle school and high school, and then generally they go off to college and we become friends and they've generally become really successful, well-adjusted adults, whether they're not because they're being musicians, but my value prop is I can take a kid through a very hard time of their life. And I've always been really focused on that, which is music is what helped me survive my adolescence, gave me, you know, gave me a life and I was so grateful to it. And I love sharing that with kids. So anybody that can take one client and absolutely deliver, whether it's like you want to be like, you know, Peter Mack, who is, I don't know, he's like the president of MTNA now here, you know, he, he creates championship players. Uh, he's just a spectacular teacher, but he's the guy that can like win the, the international championship with, with his students. You want excellence? That's your guy, right? If you want to feel really great, there are teachers that do that is take one client and do it. And then, because I, I think that truly almost my entire book of business goes back to one or two students. And I, I wrote an article about this a while back, which is I showed, and it was really because I showed up to a lot of their, their recitals and their school performances, which I've always enjoyed doing. And the other is, you know, I pulled a big splinter out of his foot one time, you know, <laughs> and they were on the, I showed up for a lesson and they were on the way to the ER and he was sitting on the steps and they couldn't get this huge splinter out of his foot. And I was like, dude, let me get this thing out. And he was hysterical. And anyway, like 10 minutes later, I had this splinter out of his foot. And I think I probably, through that moment, I probably got 40 students, you know, over the years because that story was just like, and that's like this, that's the thing about doing heart-based work that you believe in, right? Is if you really invest in your clients, that's your best marketing, right? And I, and I really believe in that from, and all the people that I know that have really having a career that has to be a part of it. Because it's still difficult to be a business owner. There's going to be tough sides to it. But if you can keep yourself positive, you can keep yourself really focused on delivering that value. If you were saying something that was in the next six months, I would piggyback off that. And so I used to do before pandemic and looking forward to do it again, is I, my recitals were an outdoor event called the Guitar Barbecue. And I would cook. <laughs> That's a great yeah. name. <laughs> and so my the first recital I ever did when I started teaching, I had like three kids show up, You know, one of which now is a principal bassist for the Seattle symphony. But the next year I was like, this sucks. No one showed up to my recital. And so the next year I, I cooked like a hundred pounds of pulled pork and had a big sign made and did an outside performance where all the kids got to play. And I had 200 people show up because they were allowed to bring their friends. And I was like, wait a second. And that was my only marketing budget was I did the guitar barbecue. And then every time I do the guitar barbecue, I would have enough, I'd have enough leads that people want to come in for the whole year. So, you know, it's just, Going kind of with your heart, I think, is really a helpful approach. Yeah. Okay. Well, we've covered a heap of ground just there. I want to pick up on a couple of things. So one of them, the last thing I got there was you don't have to follow the trends of marketing. You can actually have just more effect and probably more 
uh, true to your own heart, if you do something that you're passionate about that you would like to do, that's of your own. So, because I know a lot of teachers stress about, I don't know how to do Facebook ads and it's too hard and I'm losing money and things like that. I think what I get from you is, Eric, you'd say, well, that's not necessarily the way to go. There are so many other things to do. What does your heart say? that you would most like to do? Because it sounds like the barbecue, guitar barbecue, that's such a good name. You know, really came from a place of this is what I want to do and and sure enough, you can build a community around that. So maybe one little gem that people can take away is think outside the box with marketing. Would you agree? Yeah. And you know, and I'm, you're asking these questions that no one ever asks. So I'm so delighted to share <laughs> these with you. So I'm, I'm sorry I'm talking so much, but they're no, so cool. Keep going. It's great. You know, my, my, I want to take it to my, my kids, you know, my kids were raised on the floor of my studio and, you know, and like my students took care of my kids. Like my student, I have student when my students come home from college, they visit my kids. And I think what I'm getting at is we were able to build a very organic community around my studio and all the families, like when, when we had a child, you know, all the families were kind of there and parents before and after each lesson, when Edie was a baby. The different parents would hold Edie if the babysitter wasn't there or something, and then they'd hand her off to the next parent at the next lesson. And I realized that was actually my marketing was people were seeing us have a really beautiful life and they were seeing the work we did in these kids. And I've never really thought about it until you just mentioned it, but it was all these things that were just fun, right? And it, they were able to be a part of something fun and there was growth. And Frank, it was cool, right? Like really cool high school kids being really nice to really cool middle school kids. And they all kind of hung out together and we do performances. And at the time I was like, wow, this is just like a fun thing to do, do band camps or bring people together. But looking back, I look at these relationships that were formed and then they're at dinner parties telling all their friends about it. And they're like, oh my gosh, Branner just took 16 kids away. From, I, I went, I did this thing called Camp Branner for a couple of years before the pandemic, where I would take 16 of my best high school kids to the mountains for a week. And we transform a lodge into a recording studio and we play music all day long. It was co-ed and it was just like, wow, they couldn't believe that I pulled this off. And it was like, you know, it was, that was marketing, you know, it's just doing things that I thought were cool. And, you know, so I appreciate you asking because now I'm getting all nostalgic. Yeah. <laughs> Cam Branner sounds good. Is it going to come back? hundred percent. I'm hoping to do it. My daughter's in high school now and she's been waiting for it. You know, when Edie was little and Huck was little, at the end of every day at Camp Branner, the entire crew would um, have to learn a three-part harmony a cappella piece to sing them to sleep around the bed. And we time them how long it would take them to put my kids to sleep. <laughs> and so my, my kids never you forgot that. You are extraordinarily that. creative. <laughs> and so that was like one of their tasks. And so, you know, you'd have like 16 kids be like, as I went down to the valley. And, the, and then kids would fall asleep like 47 seconds, night three, which would be a record. And so <laughs> Edie, Edie really wants to do that. So I'm definitely hoping to bring it back. That's hilarious. <laughs> I love it. We've had a number of guests on talking about summer camps and setting them up and programs. I haven't had that full residential in the woods kind of experience before. I, 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 think, I think that could make another fascinating uh, podcast. We might have to do that. Oh, I'd love to. Yeah. I'd re we, we rented a tour bus, like a tour van, and we picked them up at my favorite club at their loading dock. Right. What kind and, of club? Uh, like it was called club? Numos. It was a music club, oh, yeah. like a nightclub where my favorite bands play. And we'd pick them up at the loading dock. So they'd like put their gear in the in the trailer, just like they were going on tour. And it was, you know, the one rule, if we ever get to talk about this, it'd be great, was I had one rule. The Camp Branner rule book was many pages, but every page said the same thing. And at we every kid had to read out a page and it said, rule book, I will not blanking ruin Eric Branner's life. And, uh, you know, with the language and every kid had to say it outside. Just, I was like, do whatever you want. Just don't ruin my life. <laughs> and, and no one ever did. So not what I was expecting. That's a very cool stuff. I can tell there'd be some great stories there that you could tell as well. I just want to go back to one other earlier thing. You were talking about excellence and the head of MTNA being, you know, that's, that, that would be the thing that people think of. I imagine when people think of me for teaching, there'd be, thinking, oh, if you want your child to do some pop music or write a song or something like that, you'd send him to Tim. So what's your view on the importance of differentiating yourself and not being everything to everybody? Uh, I think being a generalist is great if that's what you do, right? And, uh, and uh, But I think it's really good to tie it into like the emotional development, 
right? Because like what people, you know, they want to learn a pop song. Well, what does that mean a little bit deeper? It means, it really means being able to express themselves playing pop music, right? The, and so really what they want is people want to work with you to become an artist, right? That's how they see themselves, right? And they, and um, to become creative. So I, I think that it's very important to have a niche of what you do. Like, I, I'm sure you, you've probably talked to this really cool guy, Tony Parlapiano. He's yeah. all about this experience. The coolest base. name in piano. Yeah. Like what he does is so great. And so I think, um, you know, if you're in a locality and you want to be the piano teacher, I think it's great to just be the piano teacher. And, and depending on how big a town you're in, sometimes you don't need to differentiate as long as you're awesome and you're doing things that are really fun and creative. If you're, you know, in a, in a bigger market, it really helps, you know, if you're competing against like school of rocks or these different kind of you know, bigger schools or programs that are kind of popping up, that's a great idea to have a thing that you're known for, right? A thing. And it can be as, it can be as simple as helping kids navigate middle school, right? Hey, do you want to have a happy seventh grader? You know, well, this person can do it right through playing pop songs because that's what they're doing, right? You're giving them inclusion, community, yeah, um, peer acceptance, yeah, yeah, all that stuff. Yeah, so important. Yep. All right. Well, let's pivot slightly to uh, Fonz. So, how did this come about that you went from jamming, playing guitar, teaching guitar to now running, um, co-founding a tech startup? Uh, it was it was the, another one of those ten year riches where I was I got very lucky where I truly literally asked the universe. I said, I'm ready to do something different right now. I just I'm kind of burning out. I was teaching like 50 students a week. And I just was running out of gas. And how long ago was uh, this, Eric? This would have been, I mean, gosh, over six years ago is when the first ideation started happening. And one of the things that we noticed is my wife, Allison, ran my school and it took her, she did it amazingly, but it took her like 10 or 12 hours a week, right? Oh, she was doing all the admin while you were doing she did, the teaching. Yeah, she's a brilliant admin. Yeah. And she did it just spectacularly and knew all of our clients. And so, uh, I just kind of had an opportunity pop up where I connected through the Seattle scene with someone who's literally a household name in Silicon Valley. They were um, they had done many companies. They had previously exited one for an ungodly amount of money, and uh, had become an executive for CenturyLink, which is a large uh, telecom provider here. And then was looking to do their next big thing. And he saw what we were doing and was like, "Wait a second, this is." looks pretty inefficient. And I wonder if we could automate everything your wife is doing. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is exactly what I'm looking for. And I love to learn. And I was like, and what I say about everything, I'm like, I can play a Bach for you on the guitar. I should be able to figure out how to do this. So uh, I was able to start this company with somebody who's extremely technical and already had a team in place, right? That people were really wanting to work with them. So that was like the gift. And then we uh, started exploring and I just wanted them to automate my school, which we used to do the old school thing where you'd send out invoices every month and it'd be like, you had four lessons this month and you know people never paid you. And we just, it became this huge battle because he took one look at it and he was like, wait, this is terrible. Like we're automating everything and like invoices need to go. And I was like, dude, you don't know anything about what you're talking about. And he's like, I can tell you, we can go from 10 hours a week of admin to like 10 minutes if you will just do this. And sure enough, I was wrong and he was right. And you know, I've worked with this team of designers and engineers, and it was, you know, I was put in a position to fail constantly, right? And to, but also to be able to get my ideas out there and shape the project. And so it was a very challenging moment where I truly was such an inexperienced person. I truly knew nothing, but I was given this gift to learn quickly. So I bought a bookshelves of books. I read all, just like we did with music, we were learning, and I just poured myself into it and I loved it. You know, I, I thought of it like practicing. And you're not talking about uh, the coding side of things. You're talking about the just running an online tech business side of things. Is that be right? Well, yeah, I yeah. The, the, we had a team at, when we were building it. There were probably ten to fifteen engineers building it, right? So we so in the process of building the platform, it's like there's a lot involved to building technology platform, and the, from the design to the lawyers to the incorporating to the the flow and the ideas. Uh, so it was. You know, it was quite an overwhelming experience. And plus, then I had to manage them. But this person was so cool and that they knew just how many mistakes to let me make before they stepped in. And so I was constantly learning. And it was like, I looked back and I was like, dude, that's the best teacher I've ever had. This tech titan knew exactly how to guide me and then when to stop me from making a mistake that would cost, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And is, have you bootstrapped or do you have funding? 
we have now funded, you know, so we, you know, he was our principal investor for the first couple of years as we built it. And then last year we went out and we did our first round of funding. Nice job. And you got some. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Well, you're in the right place. That's for sure. Yes. Yes. So I've got to go back. Most people, I think when they realize that there's an opportunity to automate things that they're currently doing, they would go to the market and go, okay, what's out there? Did you not do that? Because there would have been other alternatives at the time. Or did you skip straight to let's build it? Uh, That's a great, well, you know what? I actually, there weren't real automations for the modern billing techniques that we see so much right now. Those weren't really in existence yet. You know, if you look at the the early days, yeah, it, it would have been the early days. And even when you say automation, a lot of people say automation, but they really mean like pinning things together, right? Mm. To truly automate what we call, there's a term called ops, operations, your business operations of what you do. And I, I know it can be confusing to some people. To truly automate that, there, there wasn't an existing thing that integrated a scheduling system into a payment system and connected it from the client or the student side into the provider side. We looked for, I mean, that, and that was kind of why we built the platform is because we, were, we had used everything on the market. And they, although they were cool, they didn't save us any time. And that was the argument from Jared. He's like, he's like, hey man, yeah, I know that this is what you want to do, but it's not saving you any time. So that's not worth doing. We have to, you know, in order to build a product, it needs to be six or eight times better than what's currently out there, or you don't do it if, with your idea. So that's constantly been our, our kind of goal in trying to stay ahead of it. Because there's the, the other piece of it is we knew this. I did have understanding that traditionally the people we were serving were not necessarily great at business, right? Traditionally, they didn't value themselves as high as other professions. Traditionally, they had a hard time enforcing a cancellation policy. Traditionally, you know, they if someone didn't pay them, they didn't really know how to deal with it. And it made them very uncomfortable. So we what the other piece that we did is we started accumulating pain points, right? I didn't like it when Johnny brought a check out of his pocket three weeks late, crinkled that had gone through the washing machine, because I'd have to talk to his mom during the lesson. Or, you know. All I didn't have to like to say, oh my gosh, you're only paying me for three lessons. Well, I told you that I was going to be out of town last month. So we just changed the amount we're going to pay you. You know, these, these pieces to it, when you tied those in, that became kind of the real differentiator. Oh, quick question. The name, Fonz. <laughs> is, it, is it one of those like Spotify or Loom, like just a random word or is there some background to it? Fonz in Latin means uh, fountain or, and so, or wellspring. And if you look at the Fonz logo, it's pretty, it's actually pretty awesome. Like if you look at it one way, you can look at it as a group of people sitting in a circle reading. That's what I see it as. Yeah. If you look at the other way, you can see a people out, a circle outstretched holding hands looking Oh out. no, that's what I see. Sorry, the outs. Yeah. So yeah. the the concept, and so it's actually, we're pretty stoked about that. So Fonz is, is that we are serving the wellsprings of knowledge, right? And that's kind of the, the concept. Nothing to do with happy days, the Fonz. Oh, trust me. I have been work. I've been trying to get close to Henry Winkler for three years. So it's de- he's definitely on my. If Henry, if you're listening right now and getting into piano teaching, we'd love to have you sponsor Fonz. <laughs> well, look, I was lucky enough to have. I think it was Jen on your team give me a demo of Fonz. She was fantastic, and I, I I've got to bring up just a few things that I was impressed with. One of them was you mentioned just before the pain points. Cancellation policy enforcement is a pain point. We all know that. Not only do you need the policy, but you have to enforce it. And one of the things that I saw that you guys had set up was this automatic SMS reminder. You can choose how early before the next lesson people get reminded. And on that reminder, it says, remember that your cutoff for cancellation is 24 hours before the lesson or whatever it is. Do you find that's made a significant impact in your users' ability to enforce their policies? Well, you know what it is? It makes people feel better. And and what I mean, because we're like, music teachers are inherently pretty good people, right? And so it's totally fair that if I say, I have a 36-hour policy and if 48 hours before my my appointment, they cancel, and that's my policy, it should be okay for them to cancel because that's what my policy says. I have to do that. as So some businesses don't do any cancellations. That's fine too, but you have to be clear because your clients will respect it. And what happened, the moment, you know, when, when I switched to Fonz, I'm not embarrassed. I was our first customer. I had $8,000 in outstanding payments. 
right? And we had someone full time working it. It was like embarrassing, but it's a like life. I've been running this school forever. And the fact that we didn't have any anymore, like a month later, because it was all just automated. And so the parents, sometimes they'd get billed and they'd be like, at first they'd be like, wait, why did I get charged for this? I'd be like, did you get the email that said when this was? And they'd be like, oh, I did. And they never ask again. And so there's a, the other big piece is decline payments, right? If a credit card doesn't go through or a payment doesn't go through, Fonz just sends them a nice note. And they're like, update here. We tried again. So often I won't even know it, right? And a card will have declined, been fixed and, and come back in. So these are the things I just thought were terribly lame about teaching because I knew that all my clients were like fluent for the most part. And the, to be honest, my clients that aren't affluent are the ones that go out of their way to pay me on time. Oh, you're saying they, affluent. Sorry, I was trying to, it sounded like fluent, but affluent, like uh, uh, wealthy. Yeah, they have means. Yeah, and thanks for clarifying. And so the, those people just don't have time to deal with it. You know, so it, it, it's been a really nice way to take away the little stressful moments that allow me to not have to discuss that. And the other thing is it's lame to sit in front of your student and ask your parent for pay- about payment. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, just taking all of that off the table is is great. And I saw how seamlessly you've built in automatic, uh, sorry, one off, sorry. Yes, obviously automatic payments. So that's, that's a given. Um, you can set up different subscription packages, group teaching packages, um, one-off payments for recitals and things like that, which I thought was great. You've also got multi-location options, which I thought was great. Even in the base level of your plan, a studio can have multiple teachers still pay $29 a month, which I thought was um, really fair. Um, And you've also got this marketplace, which I thought was a bit of an unusual name, but what it means is that teachers can have a profile page. If they don't have their own website or they're just getting started or as extra marketing, they can set up a profile page with Fonz. Is that right? You know, and yes. So Fonz Marketplace is we... This just turned out to be a a move that happened to be really fortuitous for us. We didn't we didn't plan on this happening, but it did happen. Is that we, about three or four years ago, we acquired a website from the early two thousands called LearningMusician.com, and they because they had a database of about twenty thousand teachers, they were an early two thousands marketplace, and we thought, oh, this will be cool. We'll use this to like you know build our brand, and it was a great acquisition to get going. But what we did is we just basically each account, we made a marketplace profile for them. But what we didn't realize is that by doing that, we're creating all these web pages, our SEO or search engine optimization became spectacular. And so what was happening is we also baked, you know, the Fonz public booking to where if someone can go look up, you know, piano lessons in small town or medium town, wherever, see that profile book a meet and greet lesson or an appointment with them. We were, we didn't, this was not part of the grand plan. This was like, wow, this is neat that this is doing what it's doing. And it's become this deal, you know, where there's uh, a teacher from Georgia that I'm really close with. You actually probably know her who is uh, Melissa Slocum, who, who wrote in and she was like, I've had four people sign up for lessons through the Fonz marketplace in the last week. Uh, that's weird. I was like, I know it's weird. I, this is not my grand plan. So it's, it's been a real interesting thing and been people have really enjoyed it uh, one of the other features that i i don't know if you had pre-covid but very clever that you can cancel a lesson right a whole range of lessons if you suddenly have to isolate or become sick was that new from covid or did you already have that because you know mass cancellation handy. i needed that for vacations <laughs> so that was that was in there earlier uh-huh. okay right yeah but that ability to just go no nope, sorry even a very quick notice bang sorry i'm out i've got to isolate with my family for seven days or whatever it is i thought that was great also that you support your students of your teachers as well. So customer support for a lot of these platforms is generally just for teachers, but you find with parents and students of your customers using the support, right? Well, you know, absolutely. Because the, the key is like, once it's set up, it runs itself. Like the goal is to say, however much time you spend running your studio, we need to cut 90% of that time out. And what that allows, and, and this became a problem for us because music schools that had admin staffs when we first really started rolling this out, we're starting to see like, what am I going to do for work? And it's like, no, this gives you more time to be awesome, like to spend more time meeting new people and, and marketing or doing whatever you need to do. So we know that once you're set up, it runs itself. So we encourage people to write in. Like if a family's like, I don't know about this, what do I do? We're happy to talk with them because they just need to be 
you know, set up once, then they're good to go. So it works great that way. That's great. It's just uh, sounds so hands off for, for teachers. Once, I mean, yes, there's always going to be set up um, time investment required, but the great thing is you do it once, and then you've got systems in place so that it does tend to run itself. Um, it was great to get the demo, so I really appreciate that. And I know that you offer demos to other people. This wasn't a special thing for me as well. So if anyone's interested to find out more about Fonz, uh, go check it out. You can go to topmusic.co slash Fonz and we'll be looking after you as best we can there. What are some of the biggest wins, just to start wrapping things up, that you've seen from teachers using Fonz? Oh, my joy is seeing them succeed, right? And that's like the thing that I'm most stoked about is that we have you know recently hit a milestone where we are consistently doing over a million dollars a month in transactions, right? So that's, Wait, that's, so that's money. a million dollars of lesson fees are going through funds a month. Yeah. Every month. And, and, you know, that, and that was, and we just had our 21 millionth dollar go through this morning. And so it took us a long time to get to that. And now it's kind of like really starting to ramp up quickly and that's great to see. And we're, we're really stoked for it. So I, I feel like keeping people in the game, uh, Keeping seeing people raise their rates, seeing people enjoying their work more, because uh, I truly, I mean, it's what I love to do. So, as a teacher, so it's really great to be helping other people do that as well. So, I I feel like that's one of our major wins. You know, the other win is I feel like people are finally starting to come around to it. You know, you had mentioned about about automations somewhat being available five years ago, but the big thing is that so many music like the average music teacher and MTNA, which is our big organization here, is like 55 years old. And five years ago, the average age was 55 years old. And they weren't as comfortable with going outside of these of the old models. Right. So for us to come in and say, here are four billing models that are much more modern that will save you 80% of your, your time, there was years of them just saying no, I don't want to. Right. But now it's like we have people onboarding that are in their 80s that are fabulous teachers that are like, oh my gosh, I get this. I can do this on my phone. And to me, that's like we've made it simple enough where everybody can use it and their people are starting to open their minds to it, which is that's been a hard, that's been one of our biggest challenges too. Yeah. I think there has been a shift to acceptance of subscription style models and definitely a move away from checks. I think. I mean, we abandoned checks in Australia years ago. I don't know how many years ago. And, and I think the USA is moving towards that as well, aren't they? Yes. Yeah. For sure. But the great thing is you don't, none of us just stop taking checks and cash. You don't need to. And the great thing is that from a parent perspective, I don't want to be worrying about bringing cash and writing checks or anything like that. I want it to be automated. It works for both sides of this equation, I think. Really cool to unpack all this with you, uh, and I know we could talk for much longer. Um, any quick insider sneak peeks about new features or anything coming up? Sure. One of the thing, well, we've got Bonds has a lot of really great uh, events that we're you know we're coming up, and we're excited to be a part of MTNA coming up later this month. They're they're not they're they did do their convention virtually, but you know the big direction I see Bonds going next is it's kind of starting to disappear. And what I mean by that is um, we are really taking these features and we just, we're constantly trying to simplify them, right? To where they're more and more able to be part of your brand, right? So like meaning that it's less Fonz and it's more Tim Topham, right? And so that's kind of a big shift this year. We've really working on optimizing. And what's really difficult is optimize what we call public booking, how people can go and have their first, their first meeting with you. So our roadmap is, you know, we, we do two or three releases just about every week, but we're all, we're really getting to that thing of just making it cleaner. And every time we can remove a click, that's like a big win, right? Cause you're like, oh, it's a little sexier, a little cleaner. Uh, so that, that's really our, our, our big focus right now. That's great. Well, you've built an amazing product uh, and I really hope people will go check it out. Topmusic.co slash Fonz to find out all the details. Uh, Eric. You are an amazing person and it's been a real pleasure to hang out with you. You're doing great stuff for the teachers of the world. So uh, thank you for all that you contribute to this industry. I'll do right back at you. And thanks so much for including me. I really appreciate it. It's been awesome. Look forward to doing it again. <laughs> thanks very much. See you soon. How cool was that, Eric? I could just uh, chat with him for ages and I think I'm going to have to get him back on the podcast at some stage to talk about those summer camps. How cool did that sound? 
<laughs> he's such a great guy. And if you want to check out Fonz, his software, then just head to topmusic.co slash Fonz. That's F-O-N-S. And we will get you connected with them uh, and get you the best offer we can. And also a demo too, if you want to check it out. So that's topmusic.co slash Fonz, F-O-N-S. And that is the show for this week. Thank you so much for joining us. I do hope you are enjoying these episodes and we'd love to hear from you. If you've got any ideas for shows, for guests, for topics, anything like that, please let us know. You can email us support at topmusic.co or leave a message on any of our social channels where you see these episodes advertised or indeed on the show notes page for any of these episodes as well as a comment section at the bottom. Next week on the podcast, oh, we've got... One of our team from Top Music, the amazing Jana Williamson, who's our intermediate teaching specialist. Jana creates a video every two weeks for our members on how to teach the best of the intermediate repertoire that we all use regularly in our teaching. And next week on the podcast, we're going to be exploring teaching expression in intermediate historical repertoire. She's got so many great ideas and answers so many questions in next week's podcast. I can't wait to share that with you. It's actually a workshop from inside our membership. So if you are not a member, you're getting a sneak peek into one of our popular workshops from one of our guest faculty. And we're going to be sharing that with you next week on the show. Until then, I'm Tim Topham and you've been listening to The Topcast. I'll speak to you next time. Bye-bye. For more information about this episode and to find out how to enhance your own teaching, visit topmusic.co. You'll find everything you need for your studio from lesson plans to cheat sheets, quick win teaching ideas and guides on how to build your teaching business. Plus, you'll be connected to a global community of the world's top music teachers. And when you're ready, join hundreds of other teachers around the world by becoming a Top Music Pro member and get access to all our bonus content and flagship courses. And don't forget to follow topmusic.co on social media and subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to it. That's all for today. We'll see you in the studio.